Sportsmen in the United States and Canada are the driving force behind the most amazing system of wildlife conservation ever developed that is now being applied in other countries. Unfortunately, this true history of wildlife conservation is largely an untold story, especially to non-hunters. Even after learning about this fantastic story, some cannot reconcile the benefits of this system with their emotional qualms about wildlife being killed. Not everyone is or needs to be a hunter, but the superiority of this conservation model is undeniable. Those opposed to hunting try desperately to find any information to support their opinion that hunting is a bad thing. A single action of an inconsiderate or unethical hunter is portrayed as the norm. Likewise, any finding, scientific or fabricated, that shows any negative effect of hunting is paraded in the popular press with all sorts of far-reaching generalizations and poetic license. Trophy hunting is one of their most frequent targets. By selectively hunting for mature male trophies, are hunters negatively affecting the gene pool of the very big game species they strive to conserve? To sportsmen, this may seem like a ridiculous question. But to others looking to turn the public against hunting, this is being posted as scientific fact. In the last five years, several newspaper and magazine articles have charged that trophy hunters are degrading the gene pool. Evolution in reverse, they call it. Well, these arguments may sound good superficially, and they certainly make for sensational news, because the case can be presented to the lay public without any of the professional accountability or messy details. We will explore why this notion is not supported by science. But first, it's important to know the science behind trophy. Three factors are necessary to produce an animal with antlers or horns far above average for their species. Age, nutrition, and genetics all work together to determine whether an animal's headgear will reach record book proportions. Age is the most obvious and easily understood portion of this equation. We learned long ago that tusk, antler, and horn size increases with age. Likewise, the European gamekeepers in the 14th century were already writing about the importance of good nutrition to antler size. These are not new ideas. But the third factor, genetics, is where our knowledge has increased exponentially in recent decades. Each animal has a different genetic potential for horn or antler size. Some individuals may have superior antler genes to others the same age, while some animals will always be below average. Just as some humans never reach six feet tall, regardless of diet or age. Humans have the potential to alter the gene pool anytime they influence what animals are available to do the breeding. This includes selectively harvesting trophy males, culling undesirable animals, establishing harvest restrictions based on horn or antler size, and moving animals around to establish new populations. In thinking about human-induced changes to the gene pool, we have to understand the concepts of heritability and selection. Heritability is simply the inheritance of certain characteristics from the previous generation. Antler, horn, and tusk size and shape have all shown to be inherited, and so the potential exists to affect future gene frequencies. Selection refers to anything that disproportionately removes future breeders from the population based on some characteristic rather than just randomly. Selection can be intensive enough to change the genetic makeup of future generations, or so light and sporadic that it is meaningless in nature. For example, taking a group of yearling bucks and breeding the five with the largest antlers to all does in captivity is much more intensive selection than removing a single trophy buck in a free-ranging wild population. If we take this fence line down, give him that fuel, give him that sage, and then start paralleling with them depending on what the wind is doing. Both actions represent selection, but the potential for changing the gene pool is dramatically different. I think I can, if I kneel, I think I can get him. He's just 
just standing there, isn't he? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, you got him, watch my shot, here goes. You ready? Deer researchers have been able to make changes to antler size in herds maintained in small enclosures where they had complete control over selection. Inversely, no differences in antler size within age class were observed following eight years of intensive removal of small antlered whitetails on a 10,000 acre portion of the King Ranch in Texas. The question is not whether hunters can be agents of selection, it's the intensity of selection that's the fulcrum upon which this whole issue balances. Scientific wildlife research on captive and wild populations has been providing wildlife managers with information for decades. But there is a big difference between these two populations. The kind of selective harvest pressures that can be exerted on a captive population usually cannot be applied to a wild population. There are many variables that interfere with and lessen the chance of altering a wild population's gene pool, including age, patterns in breeding success, the genetic contributions from females, and natural movement. Many times the effects of age are confused with those of genetics. Hunters deciding whether to harvest an animal rarely know if they are looking at a poor antlered six-year-old or a good three-year-old. As a result, the largest antlered bucks may be harvested, but they are mostly just the oldest deer in the population and not the most genetically superior. Therefore, seeing fewer big ones is usually a lack of older animals, not a genetic deficiency. Additionally, the older bucks have learned behaviors that make their harvest far less likely. Patterns of breeding success is another factor. Even with mature animals present, research shows that the younger animals, which still may carry superior genes, are also participating in the breeding. Recent whitetail research showed that nearly a third of the fawns were sired by yearling and two and a half year old bucks. The data further showed that on the average, a single buck sired only one to three fawns each year that survived to enter the next year's population. This obviously contradicts the idea that hunters are exerting a strong selection by removing just trophy animals. One of the glaring scientific facts strategically overlooked by those trying to spin trophy hunting as a negative influence is the genetic contribution of the female. Female ungulates contribute at least as much to horn and antler quality of their male offspring as do the sires. Experiments have shown that whitetail fawns born to the same doe but sired by very different bucks often have antler conformations similar to each other and sharing the characteristics of that mother's father. A male to female ratio of one to two or one to three means that 66 or 75% of the total gene pool is made up of females that cannot be subjected to selective pressures related to horn or antler quality. Another factor making it very difficult for hunters to negatively affect the gene pool is natural movement. Although there are exceptions, most big game populations are not isolated from naturally exchanging DNA. Genetic research shows even seemingly separate sheep populations exchange genes with one another. In whitetails, approximately 70% of one and a half year old bucks disperse from their birth area, traveling one to five miles on average, with many going 10 miles or more. I can see why at a first look you'd say, well, if you take all these big bucks out, you're not going to need more big bucks. Well, the trouble is, you're not getting all the big bucks, number one. Number two, the big bucks that were taken left a lot of DNA behind them. They were very busy during the, that period of the year. It is also no secret that poor nutrition affects the growth of antlers and horns. 
Substandard nutrition results in animals not reaching the real genetic potential, and thus a buck with big antlers might simply have had access to superior nutrition, not the best genes. Other environmental pressures must also be considered. Hunters aren't the only ones removing animals from the population. There are a lot of other environmental factors at play. Many other factors, predation, malnutrition, disease, weather, remove individuals from a population irrespective of genetic potential for horn or antler size. And these other removals are not always random, but due to many other selective pressures. Our systems of game management are based on science. And equally important is the observation-based input of other stakeholders besides scientists and biologists. Guides and outfitters and hunters themselves have first-hand experience with both positive and negative factors affecting wildlife. These groups have much to say when being fed the theory that hunters are harming a species by being selective in their take. You know, that's, that's an interesting theory, but uh, quite frankly, we are not seeing that at all. I've had guys come for five years looking for the right animal and just enjoy the hunt and watch all kinds of deer and say, you know what, I'm not gonna take an animal until I find what I'm looking for. And, and those are the kind of guys who are fair chase specialists who just love what they're doing, love the wildlife, put their money into wildlife. I mean, just the trophy hunting industry in Alberta is a $250 million economic impact. And a lot of that goes to our wildlife biologists and helps them take care of the game that everyone enjoys. Also fueling this genetic drain down debate is the misconception that hunters in general are only taking mature animals in most cases. The reality is that a very small percentage of hunters are truly passing over young animals and waiting to harvest trophies. Keep in mind too, that a trophy is in the eye of the beholder one hunter may be very satisfied with a buck that another hunter has already passed up in their search for a bigger one. If one hunter's trophy is another's pass, it becomes very difficult to accurately discuss the genetic effect of removing just trophies. The thing that I've noticed is in all of my experiences is that uh, to me, the, uh, my desire to take trophy elk, and I think a lot of people that do that, I have not seen it in my own first-hand visual experience have any effect or impact on lessening the quality of elk that, or deer that uh, are out there in the field. I've been very fortunate to kill some great elk uh, in Arizona and Washington. I've hunted Nevada, New Mexico, um, and I've hunted some states where I've, I've come home empty-handed. And that's really okay because I really enjoy the hunting. Um, you know, to me, trophy hunting or any kind of hunting is 99.99% hunting and 1% shooting. Most trophy hunters are simply taking the oldest male, not necessarily the most genetically superior. Except in a few very limited cases, trophy hunters don't take the largest male in each age class, but rather the largest male they can find during the season, during daylight hours, while in the field. Remember, hunting's not an open selection process like grocery shopping. Animals are very adept at avoiding the hunter while afield, particularly as they mature. As we have learned, the theory that trophy hunting is draining the gene pool doesn't hold water against scientific facts. There are simply too many natural obstacles blocking man from harmful genetic selection of game populations. In theory, wide buck-to-doe ratios rather than trophy harvest, have the most potential to selectively change the gene pool because fewer males in the population reduces overall effective population size. If there is a dark side to trophy hunting, it is not in genetic effect, but in negative public image. The desire for individual recognition leads some hunters to unethical behavior. Such practices such as shooting game from vehicles, using two-way radios, taking unwarranted long-range shots, though they may not be illegal, are not considered fair chase, and show an unfavorable image, which is perceived by the public to represent that of all hunters. 
which is grossly unfair. It is reasonable to conclude that the real point of these far-reaching theories has more to do with smearing hunting in the public eye than real concern over wildlife. Are we draining the gene pool? Is there real data to support this? Other than one or two very isolated cases, the answer is no. There's no legitimate data to show trophy hunting is draining the big game gene pool. However, there is data to show just the opposite. Since 1950, Boone and Crockett big game records have shown increasing entries right up to the present day. The Boone and Crockett Club has kept trophy records dating back to 1830, and yet the number of annual entries has quadrupled since 1980. Since 1994, new world's records have been set for pronghorn, bighorn, caribou, whitetail, and elk. Likewise, for the Pope and Young Club, archery taken entries have increased eightfold over the past 25 years with a minimum of 23 new all-time records in the last 12 years. Research has illustrated that deer with more genetic diversity have higher Boone and Crockett scores, higher body weights, and better reproductive rates, which translate to overall herd health and sustainability. Luckily, genetic work has also shown that most hoofed animals have remarkably high levels of genetic diversity, and white-tailed deer, in particular, are among the most diverse mammals. In the final analysis, if anything is threatening our wildlife, it's misinformation. The scientific and common sense considerations are overwhelmingly against the notion hunters are creating a reverse evolution by draining the gene pool. The public needs to be told the truth. The hunters have always been, and will continue to be, the vanguards of an incredibly effective system of wildlife conservation. Researchers, wildlife managers, and their conservation partners in the hunting community will continue to do what they have done so well for nearly a century, execute the most successful conservation paradigm ever devised. For those trying to smear this paradigm, their undoing is attacking science without any real science of their own to support their claims. Only emotion.